Yeah, Jackie was in a, also lost her father. Of course, you can see him and pray for her on that. And she wasn't a car wreck after that, bad car wreck. And she's all bruised up. But Jackie's tough, so she's going to be all right. Huh? You're a tough old girl, huh? I wouldn't say old yet. All right, we're in John 17 this morning, and this is the high priestly prayer. That's what we call John 17. Um, that's how I always remember that. And it's a part where Jesus, we've seen in 14 and 15, where he's talking to his apostles, comforting them, letting them know uh, in the best way he could to be strong. There was help coming, talking about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter was going to come, uh, kind of giving these last instructions. And now, this is a really interesting prayer to me um, because it kind of breaks kind of the walls sometimes of what we think about prayer. Uh, Jesus said, you know, to pray in secret, right? So your Father who sees in secret rewards you openly. And that's kind of what he said in the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus broke that wall a lot, didn't he? He taught us that prayer wasn't just about praying in secret, but prayer was about praying in public. And prayer was about praying where people could see you pray and hear you pray. Um, so that was kind of this example here. This was a prayer that kind of broke a lot of the walls of what we think and what I'm sure they thought about prayer because they're Jews and they did a lot of prayer. But this was an exception. A lot of times Jesus would look towards heaven and raise his hands when he prayed. Even when he would bless the food, a lot of times he would look towards heaven. And that kind of breaks kind of a lot of what we think about prayer, doesn't it? He would look towards heaven or raise his hands towards heaven when he prayed because he, he knew where that, was, where that was coming from. And, and uh, in this case here, he, he lifted up his eyes uh, to heaven, right? Um, so this is a prayer that's a prayer to God, but it's also a prayer that they can hear. He wants them to know what he's saying to God on their behalf. Um, he wants them to be aware of his petition to God for them. So it's kind of a, kind of a preaching prayer. And that's something I kind of try to steer away from, you know. I think, I think uh, sometimes we do that. We kind of have preaching prayers, but this is kind of an example of that. This is kind of a preaching prayer. He's praying, but he's preaching at the same time. He's exhorting. He's, um, it's very interesting. Uh, how it, well, I have it in John, um, but it was a prayer that, I don't know how to say it, it kind of breaks the fourth wall if it makes any sense, you know, he's like saying, I told you this, but this is this, and it's just kind of an interesting uh, scenario, um, but he said the hours come, once again, we talked about those hours, right, very beginning of John's gospel, um, turning the water into wine. He says, my hour's not yet come, right? And then as we go through John, he says, my hour's not come, my hour's coming, the hour's coming. And then he says at the end, and, and he says, that my hour has come. So he knows time. He knows this is the end. And, and, he, and he progresses that through John's gospel. Uh, he says... You know, you've, you give, even as you gave the summit, even as you give him, talk about himself, authority over all flesh, uh, that he may have eternal life. This is eternal life. You may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Kind of a reiterating prayer, isn't it? The idea of, uh, you know, this is what I've done. This is who I am. This is... Uh, does God need to know that? Does Jesus need to know this? No, they know this, right? This isn't new information. This is old information. But Jesus wants those apostles to hear him say it. He wants them to know it, right? This is a preaching prayer. He wants them to hear what he's saying to God, right? He wants them to hear it. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the, the kind of discourse we have here is Jesus expounds upon uh, these things. Glorify me together with yourself which the glory I had before the world was. Well, that's a real John statement, isn't it? Uh, almost goes back to John 1. The idea in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. And here he says, bring me back to the glory I had with you uh, before the world was. In John's Gospel, he says, no man has gone to the Father except the Son. No man has gone, been in heaven except the Son, right? 
um, the idea that he's the only one ever that has been in the presence of God and now been to earth. He is, he is unique in that respect and that he's eternal and that he's divine and that he's God. Very, very John oriented here. Um, the eternity of Christ, uh, the idea that he's eternal just as God is eternal, one and the same. Um, he says, I manifest your name who you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. They've come to know everything you've given me is from you. The words which you gave me I've given to them and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believe that you sent me. That's a really big statement, isn't it? It seems to me like they're still questioning Jesus, who he is, what he is, what he's about, right? Peter's the one who confessed, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, but you don't hear it from them that much, right? Who They question him, who are you? Tell us who you are. And yet here, Jesus kind of affirms that, oh, they know me, and they know you, and they know, they understand the word that I've given you, and yet Jesus kind of said, you're not really going to understand this until I'm gone, right? Uh, why do you speak in mysteries? Why don't you tell us plainly, they ask him, right? So, so it's, it's kind of interesting how Jesus uh, puts this forth almost in the past tense idea of, uh, of what he said. He says, I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, for they're yours. All things are mine. All things are mine are yours. Yours are mine. I have been glorified in them. Uh, a lot of things he's telling them here and putting on their shoulders and kind of kind of confident about them here a little bit, right? Kind of a little confidence here. Uh, they're, they're yours. They're mine. They're going to do. They're going to glorify me. I'm going to be glorified in them. Pretty, pretty confident statements here. A lot of confidence building statements here. Um, they're hearing him say all this about them, right? So it's really a preaching prayer, isn't it? Uh, any comments? Yeah. Yeah, it's um there is a lot of confidence here in them in kind of building them up. He says, I'm no longer in the world. Jesus already looking towards the cross, right? The idea that I'm done here. I'm, I'm done. You know, I mean, that's kind of where he's at at this point. I've done all I can do with mankind. I've done all I can do with them, and I'm done. And yet he says, now keep them, right? Make them one as we are. That's a very John statement. Make them one as we are one. What does he mean, what does he mean by that? One, how's, how are they going to be one? Yeah, faith, belief, purpose, right? One purpose, one goal, one thing, one object, one, right? I mean, that's the idea here. You know, we often think of being one as being the same. But to be one doesn't necessarily always mean the same. Am I right about that? A husband and wife, according to Scripture, we're one flesh, right? One flesh. That it doesn't make us identical. Am I right? It makes us the same purpose, same thought, same intent, same goals. Hopefully, hopefully that's what we have as a, as a married couple, right? Um, we, we are one, but yet we're individual. Well, isn't that kind of how God is? Isn't that kind of how the apostles are? I mean, they're one, there's one intent, one thought, one purpose, but they're individuals. So one doesn't necessarily mean the same uh, or identical, I guess I should say. Um, have kept him in your name, have guarded them, not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so the straits shall be fulfilled. Of course, talking about Judas here. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so they may have joy. They may have my joy made full on themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of this world, even though I am not of this world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. And I love that statement because he's saying, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm asking you to be separate from the world. 
They have to exist in the world, just as you and I have to exist in the world. It's part of who we are. I think there would be really this neat idea in my head that, you know, it would be really neat if I was really, really rich, right? If I was really, really rich, like Bill Gates rich, right? That I could just build my own little town, right? Put a wall around it, and I could only let people in there that I wanted to be in there, and nobody else. It all be full of Christians, right? And and I could just and it could just be my look, be Rex's world, right? Rex world, right? And I could just live there my whole life, and it would all be great. Wouldn't have to lock my door. Wouldn't have to worry about my kids. Wouldn't have to do anything, right? And I could just be in my little world, and that would be so nice. I, sometimes I think that would just be so nice I could do that, but. The truth is, is that that would really be unchristian, wouldn't it? Because God doesn't call us to remove ourselves from the world. He doesn't call us to be, to be that. He calls us to be in the world. He calls it, why? Because we're to save the world, right? How are we going to save the world if we're not in the world, right? How are you going to show people love if you're not there to show them love? So it's almost a conundrum, isn't it? We don't want to be part of the world because obviously that's going to lead us to hell, right? We don't want to be part of it. But we want to be in it. But we want to be separate from it, but we want to influence it. So it's kind of a hard idea to be a Christian sometimes because God wants us to be in the middle of it, the middle of what it is. You know, where was Jesus' his whole ministry? He was in the middle of it, wasn't he? He was in the middle of all of it. He was in the middle of people that hated him. He was in the middle of people that loved him. He was in the middle of all of it. There was controversy around him. There was discussion around him, crowds around him. Continually, he was in that. You know what? Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Right, there's times for us to be together, times for us to be in the world, right? Kind of what that comes down to. Um, it's interesting that, you know, we live in a world that is, uh, you and I live in a world here, our world. You know, I think sometimes when I think world, I think like stuff going on everywhere. But sometimes we forget, you know, what's our world like, you know, where we live today, you know, me and you. And... The truth is, we have it pretty easy, don't we? I mean, as Christians, really, we have it pretty pretty easy. I mean, we live in a part of the country that everybody's not Christian. Everybody's, but the majority of people are Christians here. We have it, in a way, we have it pretty good. Um, of course, a lot of the world uh, doesn't have that. But yet, you and I still live in a world that has a lot of people that aren't Christians, right? And a lot of there's violence in this town, obviously, violence where we live, and there's hate where we live and anger. So we still have an influence to make um, um, even here. So I think sometimes we need to think about where we live. You know, what does Christ expect us? How does he expect us to live uh, where we live? You know, the world they lived in, it was, uh, it was hard, wasn't it? <coughs> I mean, you had Romans, you had Gentiles, you had Jews, all hated each other. Um, it was going to be tough for them, it was tough for them. They lived in a world that was probably more prejudiced than the world you and I live in, I'm sure. It was, uh, and they were going to go into a lot of different parts of the country, weren't they? Not just Judea, but they were going to go into into Africa. We consider Africa, Egypt, Asia Minor, Europe, what we would consider Europe now, modern day Europe. Uh, they were going to go into a lot of different cultures, a lot of different religions. Um, so it was going to be difficult for them, and Jesus understood that, but he wanted to be part of it. In Jesus's time, there was a sect of Jews that were cultish, were isolationists. They were called the Essenes, and that's where we got the Dead Sea Scrolls. They lived in the desert, 
They secluded themselves. They didn't marry. They, they actually took in orphans or like maybe even stole children, some scholars say, to like promote, to like, so they would have, you know, a, a society. Um, they totally cut themselves off from the world, lived out in the desert all by themselves. They baptized in sand, interestingly enough. Um, and they were, they were that type of group, and yet Jesus never went there. <laughs> I, I, I've often thought about that. Jesus never went to them, never that wasn't part of the scope of who he was. And I always thought that was kind of interesting. Jesus, on the other hand, spent time with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, um, those that were in the public, those that were involved. But he never went to those Essenes who were so devout, apparently, right? They were the ones who were copying the Scripture. They're the ones that, and yet Jesus never went there. And I, I think that has to say something. Um, I think it has to say something that Jesus didn't want to be part of not being part of the world. He wanted to be part of the world. I mean, and like I said, that existed in his time, but he didn't seem to want anything to do with it. So it's kind of interesting how he spent his time, his days. They were not of the world. I'm not of the world. Sanctify them. Your word is truth. I, sent, I have sent them into the world. And that's, that's kind of looking forward a little. The idea that uh, they wouldn't be spared. I don't ask to have those alone, but for, all, for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you and I. <laughs> Jesus' plea for unity uh, resounds throughout the Gospels. Unfortunately, that was never achieved, but that was his goal. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. They might be one. I and them and you and me, they may be perfected in unity so that your world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Though the world has not known you, yet I have known you and these have known you sent me. I have made your name known to them, will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. So it's a high priestly prayer, Jesus' public prayer. Why the apostles are there listening to him, who he wanted them to be, to protect them, to keep them, to make them one. It's a preaching prayer. And it came at a time right before they're all going to be scattered away from each other. And yet Jesus understands that they'll come back together. Um, he has faith that they're going to make it in spite of what's going to happen. We're within hours of the cross. Matter of fact, if we want to go on this and put this with the synoptic gospels, John fits this in between the dinner and going to the brook Kidron, which is right outside of Jerusalem on the way to the mount. And then if you go into the synoptics, it's when they got there, they sang a hymn. So John puts this kind of in the middle of all this, the Last Supper, if we want to call it that, Passover meal. Some scholars think, well, it's two different events. I really don't think it is. And so he kind of fills in some of the blanks of what went on. So Judas departed, right, at the Last Supper. It's kind of interesting how he says all but the son of perdition in the prayer. Yet if we put this between those two events, he really, literally had not been, actually had not been uh, handed over yet, right? And yet he spoke of Judas, right, all but one. So maybe a little foreknowledge there. Maybe they didn't catch it in the prayer. Maybe they didn't quite understand what was going on. I don't know. Uh, a lot of things to think about here. A lot going on. Short span of time, hours before the death. He uh, goes into the garden here. Jesus, in John's gospel, we don't, he doesn't spend much time in the garden. We don't get the praying in the garden we don't get the you fell asleep didn't keep watch uh, we had to put the synoptics in there to kind of bring that into view john moves where he moves so slow to get us here now he moves fast right all of a sudden we're in the garden and the betrayal's taking place so it moves john moves a lot quicker here um jesus had met there received the roman cohort officers from the chief priests pharisees 
<coughs> so this is a case where we have Roman soldiers, we have uh, temple soldiers, we have chief priests, we have all these things. It's very, uh, every time I read this scripture, I always think of uh, Dracula where they're storming the castle. I don't know why, but torches and spears and, you know, you saw that picture where they're storming the castle to take Dracula and the townspeople are rushing out with their, their forks and their, and I don't know, I always just get that picture. That's what it was. It was a mob, right? They were, they were coming to get Jesus who had never done anything yet. We're going to show this tremendous show of force for some reason. Why? I mean, this guy had never raised an army, never hurt anybody, as far as I know, except for driving a few people out of the temple. He had never done anything violent, right? Um, never even perpetrated that. So why the show of force, right? Why is this such a big, uh, why are we bringing an army to arrest an unar unarmed man? Huh? Sure, fear. It kind of gives you an idea of wh what they thought of this guy. Doesn't it? I mean, they're a little scared, right? What can he do? I mean, he's raised the dead, healed the sick, sick, fed the multitude. You know, what's this guy capable of? He stormed the sea. He's all these miracles have taken place by now. People have talked about this, right? He uh, storm. He stilled the storm. He uh, he's done all these miracles, all these great things. There's a little bit of fear here, isn't there? A little fear. What's this guy capable of? What can he do? He's going to take an army, right? So they take all these guys out here, these torches, weapons. Uh, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazarene. He said, I am he. Judas was standing with him. And when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. John really moves along here. Why did they, why did they, why did they fall to the ground? Why did they step back and fall to the ground. I mean, they're an army coming to arrest a guy, right? Judas betrayed him with a kiss. No, it's him, right? He admits it's him. I am he. And instead of rushing to seize him, right, they drew back and fell to the ground. I am. What a big statement. Yeah. Big statement for the Jews. The I am. I am he. But I still wonder why the Romans are there. Romans aren't Jews. Roman soldiers, they don't know anything about what that means, right? Um, I just wonder what happened there. You know, what happened when he said, I am he that made them fall? If he's just, if he's just Jesus standing there in the garden in the dark. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I've always thought it fascinating in John's gospel how he brings that up. Uh, Roman soldiers, they should have been ready to take on the world, right? Uh, why would they do that? Um, maybe so. <laughs> maybe so. And then Jesus says, I told you I am he, so if you seek me, let these go their way. Simon Peter drew his sword, struck the high priest, Malchus, right? Only in John do we know his name. Malchus's ear. Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? We know he healed his ear. I always thought that was a fascinating part of the story, actually. I mean, to me, just that very act would make me be like, I probably shouldn't arrest this guy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, when he puts the ear back on, be like, ah, maybe we should let this go, <laughs> right? I mean, I just, I just always kind of amazed me. This little miracle in the middle of this, in the middle of the garden, in the middle of all this chaos, this little miracle. We don't speak much about it, but I would think that would have to be really impressive, wouldn't you? Um, it says that he, uh, he cut off his ear, right? He didn't just cut it. He cut it off. He took it off his head. And Jesus put his ear back on. This, it's not a miracle we talk a lot about. We talk a lot about the one with the issue of blood or, or the boy that had the seizures or the, or the man born blind. Or, uh, we don't talk much about this miracle. 
But to me, that's, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Uh, if you've ever lost a part of your body and they've put it back on, that's kind of a process, right? And yet here Jesus took this ear, put it back on this guy's head. I just can't believe in my mind that a few of them there weren't like, this is a bad mistake, right? Um, really interesting how we throw that in the middle. Not a miracle, like I said, not a miracle we talk much about, but he reattached a part of the guy's body, literally in seconds. He reattached a part of the man's body. That's, that's a big thing, I would think. Man, I just can't get my head around that, can you? Huh? He, uh, you got to go to the gospel synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to get the rest of the story. Yeah. <laughs> You got to go there to get the whole story. You got to put it all together to get the whole story. We just did the synoptics before this, but you got to put all of it together to get the whole thing. It's just the high priest, slave. It's only in John that we hear it's Malchus. He doesn't talk about putting the ear back on, but the synoptics talk about him putting it back on. Um, it is a huge thing. Yeah. They led him to Annas first. And that's confusing because Annas and Caiaphas, depending on where you're at, are both called high priests. That's because the Roman government kind of swapped them around. So it shouldn't have been that way, but it's how it was. So it gets a little confusing. So he goes there first. He's going to be tried four times, right? Uh, Caiaphas is the one who, well, we see that after the raising of Lazarus, who said it's better that one man die on behalf of all the people than the nation to perish. So it's him that brings that, brings that up. Simon Peter was following, so is another disciple. We assume that to be John. John's the only one that goes with him all the way to the cross. All the rest of them have gone, have left. So it's only Peter. It's only John. It's only Peter. How John gets... It's always kind of been something in my head, but how does John, you know, escape it, right? I mean, they, they accuse Peter, right? Weren't you one of him? Weren't you with him? You know, Peter's denying it, right? I mean, we get into that. But, you know, how did John make it all the way to the cross? You ever kind of ask yourself that question when all the rest of them couldn't seem to make it, and yet John somehow seemed to slip through the whole thing? I mean, if you really read through this and you really kind of study it, put all the Gospels together, it's John who's going to get Peter into the, it's, well, and we get that here, it's John who's going to get Peter, I think John who's going to get Peter into the court. Because if you, if you really look at what he says here, he says, uh, the disciple was known to the high priest, the other disciple, right? So Peter was following Jesus, another disciple, now that disciple, the other disciple was known to the high priest. And he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. So John appears to be the one who went in. And then he appears to be the one who got Peter in to the court. But the question that's always been in my mind that I've never really been able to answer is, you know, how did John make it through? Why weren't they accusing John? Why, you know... It's always been a question in my mind. I don't have an answer. Throwing that out there right now. I have no answer. I have no answer. But it's always been a question in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Well, it says the one whom he loved, right? He always calls himself that, the one who Jesus loved. <laughs> I think it was a God thing for sure. But I also think it's interesting because if you really look, another thing I think you have to consider, if you really look at it, they always accused Jesus' disciples of being Galileans. So that was kind of a mark against them, you know. Them men are Galileans. They're not learned. They're not educated. They're 
the Galileans, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't something you wanted to be. It wasn't a moniker you wanted to have, right, to be a Galilean, obviously. People look down on them for whatever reason. I guess they have more poverty, maybe. I don't know. But you get the idea they were looked down upon. You know, they were all Galileans, right? John was a fisherman, too. But maybe somehow he was less Galilean. I don't know. It's just always a thought I had. You know, he appears to have some pull. He, he goes into the high priest. He appears to know him. He appears to know what's going on, right? Where the others don't seem to have that. I don't know. There's more to the story, more to the story here um, than what we know. But, it's, but he apparently was, and we're making the assumption this was John. He never says it's him. He, even though it's, it's the gospel of John, John never names himself in this gospel. That, I mean, we've always held it to be John, but he never names himself throughout this whole gospel. He never says, I'm John. Never says that. He, all, through the go, all through this gospel, he says the, the apostle who Jesus loved. And we've always assumed that to be John. Probably is. I mean, I don't have another explanation for it, but I'm just saying we've always made that assumption. Yeah. Right, we just don't know. John never names himself ever. You know, and even in the even in the supper where it says he was laying on his breast, he never the Jesus that you know the disciple who Jesus loved was laying on his, you know. John never says it's John. And sometimes, you know, we take books and we've heard it so long, we just make that assumption, but and I think it's a good assumption, don't get me wrong. I mean, I don't know another good explanation other than to say it's John. I really don't. But but it, he never says it's him. So, uh, so it's kind of interesting. Um, the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? So Peter here denies, right? He says, you'll deny me, uh, deny me three times. So this is the first time. Was he scared? Yeah, he was. Was he Doubting Jesus, maybe, who Jesus was? Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know. I don't say I might have done the same thing. I think you can't really judge Peter. This was a hard time. This was a hard circumstance. Yeah, he was... Uh, and that might be true. I think they were all kind of scared for their lives a little bit at this point, for sure. Uh, this is a dark hour. I mean, this is a dark hour. And Jesus is standing there. That's the one they've been following. The soldiers are making a charcoal fire, for it was cold. This is spring, right? Spring of the year, early spring. Peter was also with them, standing, warming himself. Uh, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples, about his teaching. He says, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues in the temple where all the Jews come together. I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. You know, as we, you know the story. Jesus makes very little defense for himself throughout this ordeal. One of the offers struck him. Is that the way you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, if I have spoken uh, wrongly, testify of the wrong, but frightly, why do you strike me? So he goes to Cephas. Simon was standing there warming himself. He said, are you not one of his disciples? He denied it. I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, says, did I not see you in the garden with him? I, I, think, that's a, I think that's really a neat uh, uh, you know, this relationship and that, and that uh, one of the slaves, uh, or one of the slaves, high priest being a relative, said, I don't see you in the garden with him. Um, so a lot of these slaves, I guess, were in the garden, uh, not, just, not just the soldiers, not just the high priest, but there seemed to be a lot of other people with them, these people that came with them. So how big was the mob that went to take Jesus? I, I don't know. But there appears to be quite a few. Peter denied again the rooster crowed. 
Caiaphas in the Praetorium, it was early. They didn't want to go in the Praetorium because it was a Gentile court that would have defiled them, would have made them unclean, so they didn't do that because they still had not eaten the Passover. That is a really tough little bit of stuff, right? So, because if we call the Last Supper the Passover Supper, but it says, John says they hadn't eaten the Passover, right? So, we, so how does that work, right? So, did Jesus, was the Last Supper not the Passover Supper? Well, we always say it is. It appears to be. Jesus told them to go and prepare, right? Go and prepare the Passover. We're going to prepare the last meal. So, we always assume it to be. Um, well, that's, that's another thing people say. They say, well, you know, Jewish time goes from sunset to sunset. So Jesus, if he ate that meal after sunset, technically it was Passover, even though they might not have ate it until that evening or whatever. So technically it was still Passover. Um, Jesus ate the meal early because he knew this was going to come about. Um, a lot of theories floating around out there, okay? But, but it kind of, it's one of those things in Scripture that um, maybe we don't fully understand uh, the timeline, how that worked in Judaism, but it's one of those things that people question. You know, was the Last Supper really Passover meal? Um, because obviously they hadn't ate Passover meal yet. Like I said, was it considered the same day? Did Jesus take it early? Was it, you know, since it was after dark, had they just not got around eating the Passover meal yet? Were they going to do that that afternoon or whatever, or that day, during the day, which kind of would make more sense than eating it at night? Um, a lot of stuff people argue about in here, okay? So you just kind of got to, sometimes we just kind of got to have a little faith that, you know, it is what it is. I think Jesus' last meal was the Passover meal to him, whether he took it early because of what was coming, whether some Jews took it that evening and some took it that day. Some people propose that. They had not taken it yet. doesn't mean other people had not eaten it. So anyway, a lot of speculation about this because of timeline, right? Because I've got into that before. Maybe I should have brought that back up. But, you know, it has to do with timeline here. And, of course, you guys know, most of you know, I don't hold to the Catholic timeline. So to me, where all the world thinks this would be, uh, all the world thinks this would be Friday, right? I believe uh, that this was uh, Wednesday. So, so that changes time frame a little bit. Um, out of time, aren't we? Okay, talk about this more next week. Thanks for your attention.